Sorry, Salman, you're muted. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So this is uh, OSGO Life, uh, the system that we will be working with. And what we do is when we go on the OSGO Life website, uh, we can actually download a bundled version of these software, which have been pre-installed on an operating system, which we and most of us know as LUBuntu. So LUbuntu is an operating system on which uh, it's, it's a Linux uh, learners Ubuntu uh, and it is a lightweight Linux which people use for uh, for for doing like you know learning uh, new development based things. Maybe if they would like to develop uh, a small software or if they would like to develop uh, maybe a small application. Uh, for GIS, they could use this. Uh, when you download LUbuntu, you're probably not going to get all of the GIS software in it. So you will have to separately then install this software on this operating system. However, when, what the OSGO uh, Live uh, team has done is they have actually packaged uh, a large number of GIS software, almost all known to us, on this LUbuntu and has made it readily available for download. Uh, the download size is obviously big. So when you like go on this website and if you would like to download it, you probably will be presented with about four GB, four gigabytes of a system uh, on which, uh, let me show it to you. So it's a four gigabytes of a system that you would be working on. Uh, downloading, which means that you will need some time to download it and then uh, configure and install it. Uh, in my case, uh, what I uh, took advantage of was I decided to uh, pre-download it and uh, keep it on my system uh, here. So this is the one that I have and I can't just open it and run it, unfortunately, and pretty much rightly as well. Uh, if I would like to do that, I would need to set up my system in a way where I could be able to easily run it. Uh, I, assuming that most of you would be uh, users of GIS uh, who have not uh, had a lot of experience with GIS maybe or setting up computers and are not in a position to probably uh, install a lot of uh, GIS software on your computer, which are open source, and then, you know, remove them or do something else with them. <coughs> so what, uh, what I usually do with my students and what I would want you to do as well to ease out the process for you is install something that is known as a virtual box. A virtual box is an Oracle utility, which again is free to download. And many of us, uh, I mean, during our student lives and even our, uh, in our professional lives, do not want to pay for expensive software. Uh, this usually happens when you're working in a non enterprise or a non corporate system. So, and you don't have a lot of funds available to do so. So, virtual box is an, an alternative to uh, VMware. VMware is something that is that is again a uh, similar utility, but it's a little like it's, it's got obviously it's paid versions so that it turns out to be uh, quite uh, expensive. Uh, VMware uh, is not what we are suggesting that you download here. What I'm suggesting at this moment is VirtualBox. It can be run on a variety of operating systems, uh, Windows, Mac OS X, Linux, Sun Solaris, or any other operating system that you can. And then there is uh, an extension pack that you usually require to be able to work with it. 
uh, a system setup which is seamless is usually very helpful uh, for working and assuming that modern computers like almost those that all of us have have at least four gigabytes of uh, ram uh, this should very easily run on them in case someone finds it difficult to run then they can obviously go and download a software at a time or install that on their windows computers and work on them for a windows host if you click on it you're going to get a virtual box uh, exe downloaded on your computer not a very large set of file a small one as compared to the osu life so it's going to probably take uh, a few seconds to download, faster to download as well. Uh, I have it installed on my computer here. What it does is, uh, by the virtue of its design, it keeps the operating system that I have on my computer separate from the installations of GIS software that I am going to have on my computer. Now, if both of these are separate, that means that at any point I could right click here and remove the entire system and not and I can actually click delete all files and I'm not worried about losing anything on my computer. Like all of these software that I have otherwise uh, will remain to be there. And that's something that probably uh, for users like me is, is very good because if I need to change uh, something, I would not need to go into add remove programs on Windows or Mac or Linux and do that. So this is one thing that is uh, quite convenient uh, in the context of the system that we are setting up. Another important thing is that when you are doing so, you probably might, uh, well, you will obviously need to download something that is known as the extension pack. The extension pack is something which offers your virtual box to seamlessly uh, interact with your Windows machine or your host machines. So the machines that we have here, the ones that we are working on are the host machines. And again, uh, saying that, you know, the host, and this would be definitely the guest here, uh, the virtual machine, uh, would be then uh, able to exchange data between the two of them. We would be able to exchange data between the two of them and would be able to work uh, much, much better. Uh, I'll start by uh installing uh, start creating a new virtual machine and i'll show you how the process goes so i'll go with new and i'll say my osgeo live machine and i'll create it maybe in my e drive we have a lot of uh, storage well not really a lot of but let's say i have and then i'll set select my iso file so in my downloads, I have this ISO OSGO Live. The current version is 16. The one that I already have downloaded is 15. Uh, they don't make any difference if it's 15 or 16, and it's already selected as a Linux operating system for me. So we're good to go. I'll set next, and somehow I have uh, luckily a lot of uh, RAM available. So what I could do is I could go a little high on it, before this red line here and before this red line here for my processing CPUs and I can go next and not be required to assign a lot of space but let's say 35 GB should be fine uh, I mean if you're working with an OSGO uh, life you could uh, assign it as much as uh, 2 terabytes of space uh, but I mean that's that's not something that we usually need because what is usually would be doing this it would be using the storage on your computer to process data and its own storage can be a mere 30 gigabytes and that should be fine. I would recommend you keep it at 35, should do the trick. And I'll go next and then I'll select finish. Now I'll look into the settings of my system. So there's a few things that I would want it to be able to do. Uh, that is uh, be able to uh, uh, be able to access the network on the internet. So for that, I'll probably pick the bridge network, and I'll uh, I have a virtual Ethernet adapter. So I'll help 
let's go ahead and let it select it. Uh, if you do not have this virtual Ethernet adapter showing, I mean, some people might not have their systems con configured as such. What they could do is they could go into their systems and add here, uh, add, uh, or I could just probably turn on and off Windows features. So when I when I go for the turn on and off features, I could select my Hyper-V, I could turn that feature on, and some other related uh, uh, Hyper-V features, and my system should be uh, good to uh, good to go with. Then I'll have in my drop downs list uh, the Hyper-V settings, uh, Ethernet adapter available to me. Next, I'm going to start this computer or system. And it's going to ask me if I would like to try or install it. So I'm going to press enter. I must tell you that uh, when you're working with the system, it's going to be your keyboard doing most of the work. Uh, while your trackpad will be active as well. Uh, and as since we are working on a six months long program, uh, I'm sure you'll get used to it. That should not be a lot of an issue. So, this is uh, the system that I have here and the screen looks smaller and doesn't really look good. So we are going to fix all of this now. Uh, I go to the install OSU live option and I'm going to click open. And I'm going to then start moving. Select the default options. It will give me this option of erase disk. So this is this virtual disk, virtual, not the real computer disk that I just created, the 35 GB disk that it created. So, I mean, this is nothing, nothing is going to be like, it's not going to be messing with my computer at all. So I'm going to just click next. I'm going to like erase it, select erase and go next. And I'm going to give my system uh, a very simple uh, username and I'll keep user the password as well. That makes it easy to manage it. I'll not click on the automatic login and not a very good idea when it comes to Linux. And then I'm going to run install. Uh, the changes that it's going to make uh, to is a virtual hard drive on the computer. Trust me on that one. Nothing to worry about. While it takes its time, let's go through the content of OSU Live here on the website. <coughs> so what really happens is that when you are here on the OSU Live uh, setup, it can you can actually see that there is So this is uh, these are the settings. I don't know how to probably the zoom thing here. Yeah. So it was already zoomed at something less than it should have been. And uh, what am I done? So what I do is I'll uh, probably try to fix 
what I have just done. Exit full screen, first things first, and I'm going to create a bit of uh, added zoom here. So these are the the that it has. So it's not like desktop contents, browser facing GIS, web services, data stores, navigation and maps, uh, some analysis tools, uh, domain specific GIS. Uh, we're going to see that as well. Some sample data, just in case you need to work on that uh, for your exercises. Some geospatial libraries, some actually all of geospatial libraries, not some, and some OGC standards. Uh, if I click on the desktop GIS content here, what I'm going to find is uh, some of the key excellent software that uh, people could benefit from, uh, from like in the field of GIS. Cross GIS is one software. I mean, it's an exceptional software. It is uh, robust. It works fast. It uh, sort of is uh, is not, I would say, an industry standard, but capable of meeting any industry standards, and generally is uh, difficult to learn. Uh, the core features, as it says, you name it, there's a tool for it, and that's that's true. Anything that you want to do here or you could possibly think of doing in the field of uh, GIS. Uh, Grass inherently provides for it. So if you do not have any other software installed, or if you do not want to work with any other software, just one software, you could quite easily pick uh, Grass GIS for that. Uh, it's a bit difficult to learn uh, for many people unless uh, they are guided through the initial few exercises or the few phases of how the software functions, uh, it just works fine. I mean, I, I, I believe that many users are going to find it uh, exceptionally useful. Uh, it has helped me do a lot of things with a lot of fees. Uh, the software looks uh, a little old fashioned, but it is uh, reasonably, reasonably good. The other software that you're going to find here is GVSIG. Now, GVSIG looks more like uh, the SV ArcGIS uh, in its outlook. It is something that, uh, if you look at it, you can pretty much relate. Works well. Uh, it's more like an old version of ArcGIS that you would be using. Uh, it does uh, many basic GIS tasks, uh, processes vectors and rasters, and provides uh, a, base, a basic basic interface. It's got a set of algorithms that could be useful for a variety of people. I mean, the focal statistics, fuzzy logic, uh, file modeling, and sort of things like that. So if, if at any point there's a user who would like to uh, like to use it or likes the interface uh, could probably go with that. Uh, then there's uh, QGIS, uh, which is sort of becoming uh, uh, sort of you know the coming together of all GIS software. Uh, almost everything that we do GIS is possible. It's got like extensions and interoperability with Cross, Saga GIS. Orpheo toolbox <coughs> and Jadal OGR tools. So when, when it's already in itself a complete software and then it can actually access uh, the, the quality qualities or abilities of other software as well, uh, I think this is something that people might find uh, exceptionally useful. And I, I know this, the, the interface is not very really effective, but uh, that doesn't mean that it cannot do good things. It can do a lot of good things. So that's uh, that's again uh, one software that is useful. I have not really used OpenJump a lot, but uh, I have found it uh, a very good utility for just looking at your files if you don't want to anything the uh, 
too fancy you could pretty much uh, use it uh, but it's more of a small utility q field is too good so if you have any field surveys to do and if you need to collect data using your cell phones uh, probably this is going to be very useful uh, we have we have done some exercises with it here and i did not know before that it is it's actually an alternative for arc map fields uh, it's free pretty much gathers data for you can take pictures for you send it to a central database uh, with this gps location uh, it can track your field workers uh, it could help you collect data from the field and export that to qgis or look at it on a web uh, uh, server the qfield server so that's something that is uh, that is good. It's available for Android, iOS, Linux based phones, Mac OS X and Windows. So I, I personally think that this is something that that is exceptionally useful in OSGO life. Uh, one software that I've been extremely impressed with is Saga GIS. Many people, uh, many students that I come across do not know about it. And I mean, you can always say that I have not been a very good professor if I have not told, I have not been informing them about it. Uh, and that's why probably they don't know about it. But uh, since I do not relate to those kind of courses, uh, sometimes uh, I miss telling them. Uh, this is a software that offers you a plethora, a massive, massive sets of uh, uh, geoprocessing uh, tools. Uh, it can do a lot of geostatistics for you, grid analysis for you, uh, <coughs> uh, vector analysis for you, and uh, it's not a very difficult software to work with either. Everything is just there. You just need to click on a module and then give it the required data and it will work for you. So Saga GIS uh, definitely. Uh, UDIC not as big a software. It is a viewer rather. So you could just open your data and have a look at it. There's times when you don't want to open a heavier software and would just like to see what data looks like. So that's one thing that you could use. Uh, so these are some of the basic desktop utilities that uh, GIS uh, OSGO Live has. When it comes to the browser facing utilities, I would say that uh, these are good. Uh, we have uh, GeoMoose, GeoNode, uh, MapEnder, OpenLayers. Uh, it's not as much of a software as we would say. Cesium, GeoEXT, and leaflet again a library uh, fair enough i mean it, it seems to be able to do a lot of things on the browser uh, quite a good thing uh, for people who want to create uh, a solution for their teams or their customers so i would say that it's not a very uh, bad idea to know it uh, learning and the fact is that one of the fastest uh, utility out there for WebGIS that is map server uh, it can access maps from there so that's that's even much better there are many of us who cannot afford expensive licenses do not have uh, uh, a scope in a project where we could do so so I think the map server and geomos together could be very useful uh, then we have GeoNet, GeoNode. <coughs> Looks pretty simple. I haven't used a lot of it, so I wouldn't comment on it. MapBender. Useful. A very uh, reasonable interface. Um, has a lot of uh, good templates to use from. And can create uh, very effective uh, online maps. Open layers is something that probably all of us have had uh, a hint of use. Those of us who have not probably will have during this course. Geostyler, uh, as the name suggests, you can actually create style files. 
The same thing is done for uh, by QGIS for you, but sometimes we need to do so. Uh, actually, uh, the formats, the SLD QGIS uh, formats are supported as well. So that's a good thing. Uh, Cesium for 3D. Uh, I mean, there's not a lot of help out there on the community website, so it will be a good learning point uh, for many of you. Then we have uh, GeoEXT uh, again, uh, reasonable enough uh, for putting your maps out there on the browser. Leaflet, openly, uh, uh, I am forgetting the name again. Open layers, I was about to call that openly, or leaflet. Leaflet is a modern version of that, rather. You could probably use it. And then we have uh, some web services. These are <coughs> the services that you could uh, use. We are not going to go through all of these services in our work, but we're going to be using GeoServer. I find it slightly sluggish, but nevertheless it's in. So that is something I'm going to probably lead you some to some very valuable resources in GeoServer as well. Uh, in the longer run, MapServer we'll be doing. MapServer is exceptional. As I said, it is one of the most uh, responsive uh, browser facing uh, services that you could use and AEST SOS. Uh, uh, it actually works with real time systems. <coughs> then, if we go further down the line, we have QGIS server. So, if at any point we feel like we need to use that, we could do so. Post GIS, exceptional. I have had uh, some good experience with it. I've, I've seen many students uh, struggle with post GIS, uh, especially when it comes to raster processing. But this is something that can do everything for you. I mean, even if you would like to do some basic image processing, uh, it can do for you. And that's a good thing. I mean, you know, who thought that you could actually process rasters in a DBMS? Uh, Many people are not aware of that, so that's good. It's not a very useful thing to do, to be very honest. It's extremely slow, but quite possible. Uh, PG routing, uh, RAS Thaman, Open Data Cube, and Spatial Light. The same kind of uh, database management system that you have on your uh, uh, on your phones. Then you have uh, some navigation utilities which are for GPS data set. So you could probably look at them, but these are simple things. You're just going to see maps and all. Nothing really special here. There's one thing that's really special here. That's the off your toolbox. Uh, OTV is something that uh, many people are not aware of. But uh, I think if you're doing some serious image processing, uh, you must know about it. It, it does wonders. It doesn't crash often. That's a good thing. Uh, it uses a lot of methods that are implemented in OpenCV. That is an open computer vision library. So if you're not into programming or would not like to program complex codes uh, or look for codes all the time, uh, you probably could use uh, off your toolbox. And it has uh, <coughs> been funded by the Sons National to Etude Special. Uh, so the uh, probably something like that. So it's uh, it's it's for that reason that uh, um, that's very useful. That you know there's a serious cooperation behind it, financing it and uh, making sure that it develops uh, in the right uh, uh, in the right direction. Then we have uh, GMT. It is for cartographic rendering. It is an old utility. People still use it, but not as much. You could actually create these kind of maps. So this is what it does. It actually puts together your maps with uh, embellishments. So it's a cartographic uh, library sort of. Zygrim is good if you would like to look at weather forecast and tell your friends how the weather is going to be tomorrow. And then you have some sample data and these geospatial libraries, projects like projection coordinate systems and JDAL and OGR. And you have the OGC and Inspire standards on the machine as well. Let's see where our machine is right now. So it's installed. Uh, I'll just uh, click on done. And next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to shut it down. Yes. 
is going to ask me to press enter, which I'll do. And the machine is off now. It's here. I'm going to go into the settings just to double check something. Yes, the this IDE is empty, so that's what I want you to do. You can go again. Make sure that once you have shut it down, this is empty. It's not uh, showing this disk OST Alive. So if it's showing that, you can remove it by clicking right, but don't do that. You like if you have followed the previous steps, it should be all fine. I'm going to start this machine again. Might take a second. Just ignore the errors because obviously they are too complex to solve for us at this stage. So we can just uh, go on its own to the login screen. default username and password. It's getting cold in here, so let me fix a few things. I'm sorry for that. <coughs> so there you go. Uh, this is uh, my system. Don't worry, it's going to start looking fine. Uh, if it asks you to upgrade, do not do that because it's going to take a very long time. I'll just cancel it. Uh, the next thing that I need to do is obviously uh, create this bigger screen. So for that, what I need to do is uh, install the guest editions. Uh, guest editions are something which we install after installing the extension pack. So I already have the extension pack downloaded. I'll go into my downloads and since it's the same version, uh, I'll upgrade it to the, the latest version here. I hope it doesn't cause any problem. Usually it does not, but it can be tricky. It's done 100%. So I think it's fine. <clears throat> the next thing that I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go into the devices settings and insert the guest editions CD. Now this is uh, something that could get a little tricky. I would say tricky because uh, Uh, because of the fact that uh, when you 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 will find like uh, these these unusual looking files in front of you, I request you to not get worried by that. All that you need to do is uh, click on this Qt terminal here, or press Control Alt or Tab, and type cd media ls, and then you're going to get into the user. Here, I'm gonna do something here just a little. Change the font size to 18. Click apply, and there you go. Probably maybe a little bigger than this. Because you're gonna be typing a lot of things. 22. Okay. 
here you go and then i'm going to find a uh, user v box clear the screen it looks a little and the files are here with us this is one file that uh, we are interested in this is this one but we need to uh, on a linux operating system this is important to actually give the system permissions to read it or run it so to be able to do so what i'm going to do is <coughs> it's moved i going to type sudo chmod e plus x. Not a very common thing that you should do with uh, uh, your Linux uh, files, but for this particular file, we can do that. Mm -hmm. You cannot access the file. Sorry for that. There you go. Now it should be able to. So it has changed the permissions of the VBOX Linux edition thing for me. And since it has changed the permissions, so it once it says changing permission, it means that it has changed the right the, the run permissions for me. I'm going to type sudo forward slash vbox Linux run, and it's going to start running and installing the necessary modules for me. There's one more little thing that I would like to do here. See, you don't need to remember everything. You can write them somewhere with you. So, while it's installing, I'll just look through something for a second. I don't want to be missing that. Yeah, I, I, I need to run this command as well. Just a little while, probably, and this will be start. Meantime, I'll check if I have someone waiting in the log so So this is done. Uh, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run a, a quick update of the system, just in case if it's something that's missing or that's not there. It will install it automatically. Okay, 
book uh, in that's done. But the next thing that I need to do is I need to uh, install the build essential. Uh, these are some things uh, that are required for uh, the guest editions. Now my guest editions are already installed, so I don't know if uh, I sh it would have a very like serious effect or not. But uh, uh, let's say I would still install them. So what I'll do is, since I don't remember the command, uh, well, I put so no, install will essential TKMS Linux handles. Uh, this dollar U name is going to pick my username automatically. I'm going to press enter. It's going to ask me if it needs it, it needs to install some additional 110 MB of files. So that will be done. See my screen as it resized, so it looks better than it looked before, and that's what the guest editions and the build essentials uh, will do to your system or any system. So that's a good thing. I mean, from my point of view and from your point of view as well, because now you can see everything on the screen uh, far proper uh, than you could see before. So the system is partially set up. Now what we need to do is we need to actually be able to share our clipboard. So anything that we have on our windows should be copy pasteable here. So I'll make it bi-directional. Then I can go for the drag and drop. I'll make that bi-directional as well. Uh, what the guest editions actually do is it removes a security layer from over your virtual machine. Since you're not working on in an enterprise environment, that should not be an issue and that's why the drag and drop and the clip and everything works the next thing that i would do is i'll share a folder uh, with from my windows with my virtual machines so data from my window computer can come into my linux i preferably would usually select my downloads folder for that if you have a drive that you would like to share you could do that that drive if you do so would make it far more convenient to work with your GIS data for you. So you can set OK and you're going to say OK here. And then you're going to have like uh, maybe here. A downloads folder available. So now the folder that I created in my share is now available. If you remember previously we just had the SF download folder, but it says permission denied. So if I want to change into that directory, I cannot. I have this folder accessible here as well, and it says permission denied too. To be able to get that permission, I could do user mode dash a g. Yes, let me make sure. Vbox SF. Okay, sorry for that. Vbox SF. So yeah, I'm adding my user to the Vbox uh, 
thing. And if I go to this, it will again, okay, now I need to reboot the system for those permissions to take effect. As usual, we'll have to wait for it to start. This is not an error that I need to worry about at this stage. I was taking a little longer than I'm expecting it to. There you go. So the screen looks much bigger and better. Now my system is here, everything will be loaded in a second and now I can see through the software. The accessories, the common that you get with almost uh, all operating systems are here. This is a text editor, we'll be using it for some of our advanced exercises. You could use Vim, quite powerful. Uh, but not really easy to work with. Uh, GeoNode, Cesium, GeoEXT, everything is pre-configured, pre-installed. Don't need to worry about installing or configuring it anymore. Spatial Light, PHP, PG Admin, uh, Desktop GIS software. Uh, some spatial tools. We have uh, Jupyter Notebook. Uh, Monteverdi, Orpheo, Toolbox, and then we have some navigation and mapping utilities. These are like for your GPS data and Zygrip file viewer. Zygrip is good, by the way. Uh, then we have some spatial tools uh, that we did see. We have a Jupyter notebook pre-configured, pre-installed. Nothing comes handier, uh, <coughs> more handy than that these days. 
the Monteverdi Orfeo is there, R is there, brainstorm. R is very powerful, very good, very useful, difficult to learn, but uh, definitely a skill that many students and professionals should have uh, is of working on R. And then we have these web services that we mentioned. We have some sample data. So if at any point you do not intend to download data, you could do so. But since we created an external drive uh, in our downloads, so we could actually now exchange data with our Windows system as well. So when I click on this uh, SF uh, downloads, uh, it actually is showing me the same folders, the same files that I have in my downloads. And that's a good thing. I mean, if I need to exchange uh, any data with this system uh, from my Windows computer, I could do so. So if I create, let's say, a folder called GIS data, and uh, refresh it here, I'll find this folder here. If I create a new uh, blank file, sample file here, and go to my Windows download folder, I will be, after refreshing, able to see that sample file here. So that's something that uh, we needed to set up to be able to seamlessly work between the two systems. Uh, that is the one that is uh, obviously uh, uh, on our virtual machine and one is on our computer here. Uh, there's some few additional uh, things that we could do. If at any point uh, you would like to have uh, a seamless mode, which is uh, a very interesting one, if I click on it, I'll switch to a seamless mode, which means that I will feel like as if I'm working on my Windows computer, while I'll have everything on the Linux machine that I just installed accessible as a second bar at the bottom. So you see we have this Windows bar at the bottom, and then we have this other bar right above it, and I have those software accessible to me. So I could just click on my QGIS, and it will launch that Linux QGIS that I just have on my OSGO machine as if it is running on my Windows computer. While it's not doing anything, it does, does not have anything to do with my Windows computer, to be very precise, but uh, yes, it is obviously running as a guest on it. But, and then this, this, this additional thing uh, is that I have, uh, uh, I have this uh, access to my, uh, my downloads directory on Windows. So if I put anything on my downloads directory here, I should be able to uh, open it in my Windows QGIS, uh, like on this my Linux QGIS. So if there's a raster that I have and I would like to open it, I could just pick that raster, go into that downloads directory here. There's a drone survey that I have here, so I could probably uh, open the DSM from that. There it is. And click add and it will show that. So this is the the elevation 3D that we have and I probably have uh, a rather better looking raster as well. Let me see. This is the DSM. And we have a mosaic here. So I'll probably open that. It looks much better. So this is uh, a part of our campus that we surveyed, and I mean, uh, I could access it from this. This is on Linux, by the way. The machines that we just, the machine that we just installed. While this file is stored on Windows uh, in my downloads folder here. So that's how your system would be set up. Uh, I think we are done with. Uh, uh, setting up the system. Uh, I would be sharing this uh, uh, video uh, on LinkedIn, YouTube, anywhere else that you want me to on our LMS. Uh, and you would probably access it and do the next needed. And then I'll obviously give you a small exercise and a quiz so that we could uh, assess uh, the course participation as we go along. Uh, we would be happy to have you online uh, because if in the end we offer a certificate for finishing it, 
that we would like uh, to offer it to people who are present and are regularly doing all the necessary exercises. Also, there's an online attendance mechanism uh, that is uh, happening in real time on your uh, Teams uh, login software. 